Peter, t getting more into this kind of the international economics and politics of it, uh, you mentioned Africa. Uh, obviously, a lot happening in terms of changing supply chains uh, generally. Uh, give us your sense of, of what's happening out there in terms of the, the global economy. Well, we're watching this very closely now because we're seeing so many things that are new and unique uh, to the markets for us to digest. I think uh, what you've seen in, in, in Africa now is literally one country head of state after another. We're making proclamations about their independence or the desired independence from uh, Western currency, Western markets, Western dominance. And they seem to be all aligning themselves with this new BRICS movement, uh, encompasses Russia, China, India, and Brazil and the rest. So um, uh, there seems to be some, some organization. They've organized. Uh, they're being deliberate. Uh, they're looking at their, making their own supply chains and uh, captivating their own uh, national wealth. Uh, and deploying it domestically without outside influence, and you're you're seeing that. I mean, you're seeing the comment by uh, uh, President Macron of France. He said, "You know, we can't just be followers of America anymore." Mm. Uh, stunning for a Western leader to say something like that. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, is this kind of inevitable at this point? And and if so, uh, is 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 it a bad thing if if it means greater economic growth for African and Asian and South American? Uh, countries, the global south, uh, isn't that a good thing? Uh, in the long term, yes. I think global prosperity is going to benefit us here at home as well uh, in many, many ways, and we have a chance to, to benefit from that and by tagging along. But are we going to be the leaders in it? And I speak of North America when I say that. Uh, not necessarily. In fact, I think we're going to have to force ourselves to learn to be partners, uh, and maybe not senior partners in that effort, because there's an, an awful lot of very well educated, a whole well educated generation is emerging in the East and in Africa and the Middle East, South America, all of them who are as bright as we are and they're well capitalized and they've got their own ideas and, and we're going to have to learn to participate with them. Is Canada doing what it needs to do then to, uh, to recognize this new trend? Honestly, Tony, I don't think so. I, I, I think we're missing the boat on this at this point. Uh, I look at our political rhetoric. We just keep running around in circles, uh, chewing over the same issues that never seem to be get solved uh, or, uh, by, by our political uh, our leadership. And I just don't think they've either had the time or the inclination uh, to look at the bigger picture of the world and, and where we need to be. I mean, this, is, this takes leadership that says 20 years from now, here's where we need to be and understand there's a short-term political cost to get there. Is a majority of Canadians, a majority of Americans, uh, aren't thinking twenty years out. Yeah. Yeah. No, I I, I see the problem, and uh, in terms of the the U.S., then uh, I mean they're 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 going to have another big battle in the U.S. Congress over uh, whether to approve the new debt uh, the debt ceiling limit and so on. Uh, you know, it's like a return to the '90s on that, perhaps, but. Uh, isn't that indicative of a country that doesn't have control over its own spending and its own economic choices? Well, I think that's right, Tony. And, and you know, you and I have had this discussion before. Where if you look at the complexity of the world's problems, the economic challenges, the economic opportunities, uh, the the social issues, everything that's facing us today, they're getting more complex uh, exponentially every year. Our political leadership seems to be either, you know, at best, the same old team. And at worst, they're getting we're getting less and less qualified people to deal with that. And you're seeing that in the debates in the states about debt limits and the rest of it. I mean, the fact that America go from you know eight trillion in debt uh, when George Bush Jr. left the White House to thirty one trillion, nothing else in America has gone up that much during that period of time. So from a balance sheet standpoint, uh, it's it's full speed in the wrong direction. In Canada, it's the same. Yeah, and uh, people don't. Uh, realize that we, we keep adding to our own national debt, don't we? Yeah, I was just looking at it this morning. We're, we're approaching 1.3 trillion. And I remember, uh, you know, if you go back a decade or more, we were pretty much between that five and 700 billion for a very long time. Right. We suddenly double it and we're on track to double it again, excuse me, over the next uh, uh, decade. Um, and I, I am concerned because I do hear things from, from friends of mine in the uh, in Ottawa saying that there's there's some philosophy going around and both parties seem to be adopting it that, you know, we could actually survive a five to one debt to uh, GDP ratio. And a lot of Western countries are looking at that and coming up with uh, narratives to, to support 
you know, a higher, higher and higher debt levels. Uh, I'll tell you, in the private sector, nobody agrees with that. Right, right. Well, uh, I'm sure uh, this will be a topic either uh, on the top of things or underlying in the next few months. We've got one more segment with our guest, Peter Deeb. We'll be back right after these messages. 